This is a production of Cornell University. So as my title shows, I'm going to use this opportunity to sort of look back over the last few years of different research projects I've been involved in, in which we particularly looked at how arthropod communities uh, respond to different ag management practices, environmental factors. And so the common theme will be community level response. Uh, where the factors differ will be the focal arthropod tax that we're looking at, the, crop man the cropping system, and then the landscape context of the area. So I'm gonna try to cover three different topics here, and so I might move quickly. Feel free to interject if you have any questions. So just about myself real quick, as Don said in the introduction, the main goal, if I could reduce it down to one idea, is that my work tries to identify management practices or other environmental factors that maximize the abundance and diversity of beneficial arthropods in agroecosystems, and if possible, concurrently measure ecosystem services as well. So before I get into the three topics we're going to look at, I just uh, want to point out, again, everything I'll talk about today is at the community level, or at least multiple species systems. And so when I think of these, you sort of have different analytical toolboxes you can pull from to assess communities that differ than, say, working at the population level. And so one objective may be to look at diversity. And so some of the things I'll present today might relate to species richness, where we'll present rarefaction curves, which is sort of a standardized way to compare species accumulation as it rises with sampling intensity uh, among locations or habitats. Uh, we may look at evenness, the relative abundance of different species within a system. Or we may combine these two things with richness and evenness into a single diversity indice, which you've probably all heard of. Or we may use similarity indices if I'm interested in comparing the amount of overlap of species among different habitats or treatments. The other sort of toolbox I'll pull from is this idea of community structure. Because when you work with diversity measures, you sort of lose that species level resolution. You're reducing everything to a number, per se, and you don't know how different species are responding in different ways. And so here I'm going to present results from different ordination techniques where we can look at how species and treatments associate with one another by identifying sort of dominant gradients in the community and then looking at groups of species and how they're responding. And so within that, I'm looking primar using primarily redundancy analysis, which is a form of constrained ordination, uh, where we're looking at actual how the environmental factors in our experimental design relate to these subsets of the community. And then another one I'll introduce is this idea of principal response curve, which is similar, but it has an added layer of complexity in that you also have a time component. So the principal response curve would be something like a multivariate repeated measures. So how these species respond to treatment factors at multiple points in time. So I'm a little ambitious. I'm going to try to get through all three of these. But uh, I just feel it's interesting to sort of take a broad look at three different studies. So the first one I'm going to talk about are ground beetles, which are in the family Carabidae, uh, in a maize cropping system. And the landscape context would be then these ridge and valley physiographic province in central PA. Uh, the second one, we look at a broader beneficial group of taxa. We have the pollinators, predators, and parasitoids, and how they're responding to practices in mid-Atlantic tree fruit, specifically south central Pennsylvania. And then the third one is a much different system. I'm looking at how wild bees respond to different conditions in community gardens throughout New York City, so an urban landscape context. So let's begin with the ground beetles. So for each one, I'm going to sort of talk about those three factors. So as far as the landscape, uh, you have this ridge and valley region here where you sort of have these long parallel forested slopes. And in the valleys, there are these ag-dominated valleys. And so depending on where your farm may be, you could be in the center part of the valley in an agricultural matrix, or it's not uncommon to be on the edge of the valley bordering directly adjacent to forested areas. So that comes into play in part of our research as well. And the focal taxa for this group will be members of the family Carabidae, which are a very diverse group of beetles. If you haven't heard of them before, there's about 40,000 species worldwide, maybe 2,000 in North America. And they're very popular with entomologists because they seem to be good bioindicators. And so we can use them to test the effects of different management practices and what have you. They also provide us with many great ecosystem services. So many people go throughout their whole lives never looking at these small little beetles near their feet, yet they're providing us with wonderful services such as pest predation, uh, they're becoming more widely known for their predation of weed seeds. And some estimates are that for all the seed removal from a system, 40% can be attributed to just these, these beetles alone. 
And then the cropping system or the context of the study uh, is going to deal with this introduction of transgenes into agroecosystems in this region. And so we've done several studies here. I'm going to focus on one that's looking at uh, transgenic maize, that is corn rootworm protected, which is a beetle pest. And this BT maize expresses a CRY3 toxin that's supposed to be directly targeting this beetle pest. And so our basic question coming into it was introducing this new pest management technique, could it potentially affect non-target beetles that are beneficial and live in the same area? Uh, a lot of studies work on these non-target effects and often they try to isolate the effect of the transgene and its product. We use a slightly different approach, what I like to refer to as a systems approach, a real world approach. Uh, for example, this CRY3 BT maize comes coupled with other seed management technologies including neonicotinoid seed treatments, which could potentially also negatively affect these communities. <clears throat> so we designed a set of tiered studies assessing the effects of BT maize. Our field work was preceded by laboratory toxicology work, uh, where we tested the effect of the cry proteins, for example. And long story short, they seem to have no effect on the beetles. We fed many different species of crabid beetles large amounts of BT corn pollen for hundreds of days in a petri dish in a drawer and they survived just fine. Different story with the seed treatment. So when presented with seedlings with the neonicotinoid seed treatment, we had nearly 100% mortality of these beetles in the lab setting. However, there did seem to be a slight anti-feedant effect, so we wondered would we pick up these effects in the field or not. So then we moved to sort of an ecotoxicological approach. So how are populations, communities responding in a field setting? And so here's an example of one of the studies we worked on that we called the ecotoxicology of transgenic maize. And we would have these randomized complete block designs in which we would pitfall trap for beetles. It's the most commonly used trapping technique for these epigeal or soil surface dwelling arthropods. Uh, it's basically a sunken cup in the ground. Anything that crawls, around, crawls along falls in and we collect it. Uh, the treatment factorial we used was based on genetics and then on conventional management practices. So the first part of the factorial would be whether it was the BT corn or its nearest genetic isoline. Keep in mind though, the BT is inherently coupled with the neonicotinoid seed treatment. So it's a coupled technology. We're not trying to differentiate among them. However, any effects we see in the field, we were attributing then to the neonicotinoid based on the laboratory toxicological work. The second part of the factorial then is whether there is a soil insecticide applied at planting, a pyrethroid that's a conventional management for corn rootworm in non-rotated field corn versus none. So we get these four different designs. For example, isoline unmanaged would be our control. There's no pest management practice at all there. Isoline managed would be sort of a conventional management with that soil insecticide. BT unmanaged would simulate a grower who decided to adopt the BT technology with a neonicotinoid to control corn rootworm. And then this one I call the double whammy, the BT with uh, the neonicotinoid C treatment and the pyrethroid soil application, just to round out the factorial. <clears throat> and so I like to put these slides in. I don't want you to be able to read that, but this is just to impress on you when you decide to do community level work, the amount of tax taxonomic investment and sampling effort that goes in, we collected over 7,000 beetles, every single one pinned and identified the species uh, with the help of Robert Davidson from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. And you can see here we found quite a diverse range of beetles too in a cropping monoculture, 50 different species of just one family of beetles, right? So there's a lot going on out there. <coughs> and so since the pest management inputs occurred at the beginning part of the field season, at planting, uh, we were interested in how these communities responded to treatments over time as well. So here's a case where we decided to use this principal response curve coordination technique. And basically what you're plotting are what we call the temporal trajectories of community composition. And in order to do a principal response curve, it has to be in relation to a control. And so I have this little, in case you haven't seen a principal response curve before, I have this little training slide as what it looks like. So the output, the visual output, would be a control shown as a horizontal line with time going left to right. And then the temporal trajectories would be the communities in your different treatments. So the interpretation for this would be that treatment A as a community in that treatment overall responds in a negative fashion on average to the control. Treatment B, the community's responding in a, in a positive fashion, meaning you're finding 
the individual species at higher abundances. Keep in mind that these lines are entire communities. Those aren't populations. And so in order to look at species-specific data, the principal response curve comes coupled with what are called species weights. And so if you have species with a positive species weight, they tend to follow the principal response. If they have a negative species weight, they act in the opposite <coughs> fashion. Because inherently, when you study communities, there's a lot of fuzziness, and you get differential reactions to the different conditions, right? So you have different species responding differently. The line represents the overall trend at the community level. And so now, what did we find from our ecotox study? It was two years. That's why you sort of see the two groups from left to right. Again, the horizontal line where you see those darkened circles, that's our control, the ISO unmanaged. And then the other three you can see pretty closely follow one another in that you see where those large dark arrows are, those are our pest management inputs. You see a decline in all three communities for the three treatments over time, followed by a rebound later in the season that may be due to immigrants coming in or later emerging species or what have you. And so we're concluding from this, it seems to be that even with the transgenic technology, that neonicotinoid C treatment also has a deleterious effect on the community. And so you get this same response no matter which treatment we were looking at. Um, keep in mind that not all of these uh, transgenic crops come coupled, though, with these C treatments. So we did do another study that I'll just say what we did. I and mean, it was a more of a diversified farm setting where we had sweet corn, potato squash, and we compared transgenic systems versus conventional. No control plot, but just using grower standards, we managed the two. And we documented pesticide inputs and looked at community level response. And in that case, like this diversified farm setting, what we found is that the isoline, the non-transgenic plots actually required more insecticide inputs due to lack of control of the focal pest taxa that the transgene controlled for in the transgenic plot. So in that case, these little blue squares you see here, these are species accumulation curves. And so as you increase the number of individuals you've collected, you increase the number of species. In almost all instances, we had slightly higher species richness actually in the transgenic systems due to what we believe were fewer insecticide inputs just due to effective control because these did not contain that, that seed treatment that could be affecting these epigeal coleoptera. So in general though, we found that we really just weren't finding any differences between transgenic systems versus <coughs> conventional. And so uh, we wanted to do an additional study to consider, well, what about position in the landscape? Does that affect the ground beetle community? And so again, we're in this ridge and valley region. All of our work so far had been done and sort of surrounded by an agricultural matrix. Yet there were all these farms that were directly adjacent to the forested area. So we performed one more study uh, where we looked at the effect of these field margins were in your growing maze next to this continuous forested habitat. And we did more pitfall trapping. And so we set up this transect design at multiple locations throughout the valley where you had traps extending from interior forest from left to right, going through a grassy margin typical for farm vehicles, and then the whole way into the interior part of the maze field. And so this experimental design allowed us to approach, uh, approach the data from two different ways. We could sort of group the traps and just compare between discrete habitats, forest versus grass versus maize, what type of beetles are we finding? Or we could use the transect design to look at how the community shifts from one location on the transect to the next. And we were trying to categorize how are these beetles responding to these ecotones in these agricultural landscapes. And so first, at the discrete habitat level, we just looked at biodiversity, how it differs. And these turned out really nice. I even thought about submitting this to like an ecology textbook or something, because it really shows why you should use rarefaction to compare species richness. Uh, because there was a sampling bias. We had pitfall traps in the corn and the grass and the forest, but if you think of the vegetation in the forest, it's very dense. The activity density of the beetles is much lower. And so just on average, we caught many more beetles in the corn, just because it's a much more open environment, which can bias then the number of total species we think are there. So if you would just look at the endpoints, as far as species richness, they're all very similar. However, rarefaction allows you to go back to a standardized number of individuals collected, let's say around 300, and we found significant differences between the forest 
and the corn community as far as species richness. So the forest was much more uh, diverse than the corn based on species accumulation rates. Likewise, with dominance distribution or evenness, you can see the forest on the bottom here. The most abundant species just represented maybe 12% of the total number of beetles collected. Whereas the corn and the grass, you get these highly skewed dominance structures. Harpalus pensylvanicus, a good species, a weed seed predator. However, you can see nearly 60% of all the beetles caught were one species. So you get these really skewed dominance structure. Uh, same with the grass here. So overall, we're concluding that the forest represents a much more diverse and stable community embedded in these agricultural landscapes. So now, what about using the transect to look to a spatial type analysis from one trap location to the next? So we decided we really like that principal response curve. But if you remember that that's supposed to be used for temporal trajectories, we thought, can we sort of trick the program and just do it in a spatial context? So each of these dots from left to right represents a position on the transect. And so we said our interior forest one is sort of the baseline community of crabids what would be there if we didn't impose agricultural fields on the landscape. And so we considered that our control and we really took the species by sample matrix from that location and just replicated it multiple times in our data set. And then we compared the Carabic communities found at each location of the transect back to the interior forest one. So each of these represents the relative dissimilarity with the interior forest community. And so we, get, we put it in a principal response curve and we get this nice, you see as you approach the forest grass ecotone, the crabbit community is inevitably being influenced by the neighboring habitat and it starts to become more dissimilar to the interior forest community. Then as soon as you cross into a new habitat, you get this drastic decline. And again here as you approach this next ecotone. So we found obviously a significant difference in the crabbit community between forest and corn. And so that was one of our objectives going in. Do the crabbits perceive this ecotone as a hard edge or is it highly permeable? And so from this, we would conclude that it was a, a hard edge, right? You get this very quick, rapid turnover in community composition. Remember the species weights, the positives follow the principal response. So these we could identify then as forest specialists because they follow, they become less abundant as you move from left to right across the transect. These we would identify as corn specialists because they would actually increase abundance as you come uh, into this area here into the corn. However, that's not the whole story because when we plotted population distributions, despite that quick turnover, we were able to identify several species that seem to be ecotone specialists. And just anecdotally, we noted from collecting in other maize fields in the agricultural matrix that we seem to be getting some different beetles at this forest adjacent location. In particular, Tarosticus digicus, Psychotrachylus furtivus, Pisilus luca blandus. All of these were at much higher abundances or weren't even present at the ag matrix location. And so when we plotted their distribution, they seemed to be going readily from forest to cornfield. And so our last question was, can we document that there's a significant difference in the communities in maize adjacent to forest than those embedded in the agricultural matrix? And so we sort of pulled data from all kinds of different studies all over. For example, the blue circles might represent locations that are in the agricultural matrix. Yellow are locations we sampled from the forest adjacent. And we basically did pairwise similarity calculations, which are rooted in the number of shared species versus the number of unique species in each. And so when we looked for similarity between ag matrix and forest adjacent locations, we found that similarity was 17 to 53% lower than similarity between just different ag matrix locations. So what we were concluding is that the Carabic community in these forest adjacent locations were distinctly different than those within the agricultural matrix. So for the first study, what are some key findings? At the local level, we were again looking at the introduction of these transgenic systems. We found that both conventional and seed-based pest management tactics seem to similarly influence carabids on these northeastern small farms. And we attributed that to the, the effect of that seed treatment, which may have deleterious effects on these ground-dwelling beetles. And we could detect this in the field setting, just as we detected it in the lab setting as well. Neonics obviously being more in the news now with potential effects to bees as well. 
At the landscape level, we found that crabbed communities in forested areas are more diverse, exhibit high levels of complementarity, meaning dissimilarity with neighboring ag land. And so this is evidence that you should try to retain these forest fragments in agricultural landscapes because the, the beta diversity will be much higher. You have a lot of species turnover. However, there are some species that readily move across that ecotone and they seem to influence the communities in adjacent maze. And so the next question would be interesting to see is if this affects, say, ecosystem services if, based on your position in the landscape and proximity to the forest. <coughs> All right, the second study. This one, we look at a much wider range of beneficial taxa because we're including pollinators, predators, parasitoids uh, in tree fruit growing systems. So I've been, I've been lucky to get involved in a lot of different systems uh, with a lot of great collaborators. And so I'm partial to this one because it's where I'm from. I'm actually from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is in South Central PA and Adams County, which is a huge fruit growing region. And so you have these nice sort of rolling hills or mountains and it's very conducive to fruit tree production because you, you put the orchards on these slopes and the cold air is able to sink down in the valley to prevent a frost damage on, on the trees. It's very good growing conditions for apples, peaches, cherries, what have you. And fruit trees are notorious for having a very complex arthropod uh, uh, taxa. I mean, you have a wider range of beneficials, a wider range of pests, and so it's a very interesting system from a management standpoint. And so uh, we were looking at, again, predators like you see on the left here. Everybody knows ladybird beetles. Their larvae are also very effective predators. Uh, we looked at lacewing larvae. They look like little alligators. They're great predators. Minute pirate bugs, anthocoridae, spiders, and even the larvae of surfeit flies, those little hoverflies that mimic bees, very good predators. We looked at the community of, of parasitoids, uh, members of the family Ichneumonidae, Braconidae, Chalcid wasps. And then we also looked at bees, so anything from bumblebees to green metallic bees, all kinds of different bees, which we found many of in these systems. <coughs> and so this is part of a collaboration that's ongoing uh, that I work with people from Penn State from the Fruit Research Extension Center, especially Dave Bittinger, um, who does a lot of work down there. And a lot of what we do, again, is in that ecotoxicology realm where we're looking at how arthropod communities respond to pest management practices in tree fruit. And the work I'm going to present today came out of this program within the USDA RAMP uh, funding program, the Risk Avoidance and Mitigation Program. And so essentially we're comparing conventional pest management practices to these newer reduced risk tactics that growers are starting to adopt as a result of the Food Quality Protection Act. So the Food Quality Protection Act suggested phasing out these organophosphates and carbamates, uh, which can be toxic to humans and, and workers in the field, and the reduced risk are supposed to be, to be safer. Uh, and so we're comparing, does that translate into elevated numbers of beneficial arthropod taxa as you switch to these new programs? And so in this system, uh, throughout Adams County, we relied on working with local growers. They allowed us to establish research plots, which were sort of paired blocks of under standard management or reduced risk programs. So reduced risk might include uh, the use of pheromones to disrupt mating. Uh, it, could be anti it could be microbials, it could also be neonicotinoids because they're considered lower mammalian toxicity, uh, a wide range of different products. Whereas the standard plots were mainly managed with the organophosphates, carbamates, and pyrethroids. And so we wanted to look at the response of the beneficial community. So for predators and parasitoids, uh, we used a bug vac. Entomologists get to use these cool things like this. <laughs> It's a leaf blower with an inverted function, function, and we just basically got all the insects off the tree as we would, we walk around. And then the bees, we use pan traps, which you may be familiar with, are basically colored bowls, blue and yellow and white, highly attractive to bees, that have a little soapy water, it breaks the surface tension, and it's able to catch bees that way. So two different sampling methods, and we're looking at uh, the beneficial community here. So what about differences in pest management? Again, we use the systems-based sort of real-world approach. Uh, Dave Bittinger uh, acted as the scout and the guide as far as pesticide inputs. And so we kept track of what the different growers used for the different needs and the different locations. And really, 
what I want to point out here is the drastic reduction from 95 to 50 percent in organophosphates and carbamates when you compare the standard versus the reduced risk. Uh, here are some of the reduced risk inputs. And then another thing I want to highlight, just total pounds of active ingredient per acre. By adopting reduced risk te technologies, you reduce per acre five and a half pounds of active ingredient. And so a real drastic change. We used the environmental impact quotient uh, for the different insecticides provided by Cornell uh, New York IPM program, where you can sort of get this general idea of environmental impact because it includes the idea of uh, persistence in the environment, effects to mammals, fish, arthropods, pollinators, all kinds of things. And we had an 83% reduction in this idea of environmental impact. <coughs> so did this translate into more beneficial arthropods in our tree fruit systems? Uh, we got a different story depending on which group we looked at. So here's one of those redundancy analyses where we could look at uh, do the communities respond to different treatment variables. And what I want to draw your attention to are these darkened squares. The ramp would be the reduced risk, and the, the standard is obviously the conventional management. And you can see all these vectors represent all the different beneficial groups within predators and parasitoids. And the general trend here is very stark. Right? You can see they're all trending towards the reduced risk plots. We found a significant effect of treatment such that the vast majority of the beneficial community were found in higher abundances in the reduced risk fields as opposed to the conventional fields. Some of these oddballs over here are actually pest species, which seem to be uncorrelated, so equal abundances regardless of system. So this, you have braconid wasps, ichneumonid wasps, green lacewing predators, minute pirate bugs, ladybird beetles, assassin bugs, we have great names for these, spiders, all much higher in the reduced risk. So as far as the pollinators or the wild bees we looked at, we actually got a different story. So here you can see, you look at these axes, you have standard versus ramp. They're both clustered right near the center of the biplot, which means they have a very low effect size, and we found no effect of pest management program on wild bees. However, these triangles you see all around the perimeter here, those are the different locations. Those are just the grower names. And you can see we got widely divergent communities depending on location in the landscape as shown by the different growers. So for example, so again, no effect of treatment. However, for example, Pipinapis prunosa, you may recognize as the squash bee. So we co collected that near this Harner farm. There, he must have been near some agricultural fields with a lot of cucurbits. That's the only reason I can think of to catch that. You have other things like Serotina, Osmia, which require sort of a structurally complex environment because they're cavity nesters in wood. And so the Dively may have been located next to a forest edge or something like that. So this is something we're actually pursuing right now is looking at landscape predictors for wild bee diversity within um, orchard systems. And so this is sort of anecdotal evidence or suggests that the landscape is what's driving bee diversity in our, our orchards. And just to drive home the difference between treatment and site location, again, these are those rarefaction curves, species accumulation. Comparing bee diversity between reduced risk and standard, they overlap completely. No difference in diversity. However, when you look across site locations, you get wildly different things as far as the number of bees collected to the number of species found even at standardized uh, levels. So something's going on at the, at the landscape level. So some conclusions from the RAMP the reduced risk study. So trends associated with adoption of reduced risk tactics were established in this Agnello paper from which researchers at Cornell were also involved. This was a multi-state study up the eastern seaboard looking at how, what it means to adopt reduced risk pesticides or pest management programs. Overall, they lower the insecticide low, load. They lessen environmental impact. However, they are more expensive on average to implement. So our study was sort of a follow-up, what's going on with the beneficial arthropod community? And it does seem that reduced risk tactics support beneficial arthropods, especially those providing biological control, not necessarily the pollinators. And so to address this idea of being more expensive, one question we have is possibly over time, with the establishment of these biological control services, you might be able to offset some of those added costs of adopting those technologies if you build up a real strong biological control community. And we actually, uh, if you're interested in this, it looks cut off, but we just pub published a paper in Journal of Economic Entomology that describes this, this RAMP study. 
And then since the theme of my talk is sort of this local versus landscape, just to summarize that, predators and parasitoids responded strongly to local pest management practices. We believe that's because they have limited mobility and they also have strong associations with what they're feeding on or what their hosts are for the parasitoids that are found in the orchard. Right? So they have incentive to stay local. The bees are operating on a different scale. Uh, evidence of this was a recent paper showing that you can actually predict bee diversity in orchards based on the percent of forested area at a thousand meter radius. Bees obviously have greater dispersal capabilities and throughout their lifetime they're relying on multiple feeding resources. Their nesting resources are often going to be outside the orchard as well. They might just be coming into the orchard during uh, bloom period right, for resources. <coughs> And then the last one, I'll transition to uh, an urban setting. And here, uh, when I came to LIU, I knew I wanted to do something maybe in the community garden setting. And I was starting to get interested in, in bees and bee diversity. So here we were looking at community gardens and how they support wild bee communities in a heavily urbanized setting. Uh, urban is sort of used loosely in the literature. New York is a very you know, metropolis with a heavily urbanized setting. So the New York City gardens, you see a lot of raised bed, although not all. Some have some row cropping and there's communal sort of gardening. But in general, you get situations like this. Um, there are over 700 community gardens in New York City. So, and it's growing, the numbers are put together. That represents a large portion of the landscape. And if you look at the surrounding landscape, almost 70% of it is impervious surface. Right? So as far as resources for, for bees, they could be limited. <coughs> and People growing food in the city, just like anybody else, can benefit from insect-derived ecosystem services, whether it be biological control or pollination in this case. So I focused on bees. And a study by uh, Kevin Madison and Gail Longoletto found that of the commonly grown crops there, over 90% benefit from bee pollination services. Maybe not totally rely on, but at least benefit from. And so the group we studied were wild bees, like a bumblebee here, although they're five different families you might collect. Uh, we used, again, different trapping methods to see what was out there. So here's a, a bumblebee visiting a budlacia. And so the, the study was relatively straightforward. So we had these three basic research questions, and I worked with some undergraduate students at LIU on this project. Uh, the first one was, what bees are found in Brooklyn, New York community gardens? Because something that I tried to include in all these studies is species level identification to establish baseline information. You know, sometimes we want to answer these bigger questions and we put the, right, we put the cart before the horse, right, when we don't even know what's out there. And in fact, to some of these very common systems, we're finding new species still to this day. And so the first thing I try to always do is work with taxonomists, get everything identified. This baseline information could be used in the future to see how communities change, for example, in response to climate change. And so these historical data are very important. The second question was, does bee diversity differ among community gardens throughout Brooklyn, New York? So it seems like a simple question, but we thought it could be possible that due to the severeness of the landscape, the severity of the landscape, that you just have a small group of generalist species and you, no matter what you do in your garden, you get the same small group of bees. But assuming we did find a difference, our third question was then, can we build a model, a simple model, just describing what environmental factors best explain variation in bee diversity among gardens. And we included both local variables and landscape variables and sort of had them uh, both included. So we established research sites uh, throughout Brooklyn. This, is a sing this makes me a little sad because it's just a single slide. But as Megan can attest, this is a huge pro <laughs> project because you have to procure keys. You have to get there, right? You can't carry all your nets and equipment always on the subway, so you're driving and trying to find parking. And it can be a huge headache. <laughs> so we, uh, compared to Megan's work, which you may be familiar with, this was a smaller scale, again, because I, I was typically working with just one other student. So we had a sites that were spatially distinct, and we tried to in include sites that approached land use in different ways. So typically, your community garden may be the size of a single home plot. Maybe it burned down 50 years ago, and they put in a community garden. Others, like East New York Farms here, is about the size of a half a city block, so size, land use, plant diversity, we try to include a wide range of different variables. Bee sampling, right, the best part, it's why you become an entomologist. Uh, we did for two years, <clears throat> we sampled the bees bi-weekly, we used the pan traps again, which is a passive technique, 
so they're just attracted to those voles. And then we also wanted to use net sampling uh, where we actively scouted for bees and we tried to cover the whole extent of the garden. And again, everything identified as species. We received a lot of help from John Asher at the Museum of Natural History, although he's not there anymore. But he identified a lot of bees for us and verified them all the species level. And then while we're doing the collecting, while we're in the gardens, we concurrently also measured environmental factors that can be used as predictors in the model. And uh, we kept it relatively simple. So at the local level, we looked at the size of the garden. We looked at percent area and the different land uses, cropping areas, non-crop areas. We also used plant diversity, which was just measured as total species richness. So I had people, say, from the Brooklyn Botanical Garden come with me, would walk around and just identify as many plants as we could at each location. And then light availability, which was, uh, we used this hemispheric photography, which was introduced to me via Megan. Uh, but this is a great way. Light availability isn't something you maybe consider that much in other settings, but in an urban setting, especially New York, which is so, it's such a vertical city, it can have huge effects on the community, right? If you have a tall building right next to your garden, it could be cast in shade for half the day. So this hemispheric photography allowed you to get a picture from horizon to horizon, and there are certain software that you import the pictures and it calculates the amount of light intensity over the course of the whole growing season. And at the landscape level, uh, again, we kept it relatively simple. We had our garden like you have here in the middle, and we looked at two different radii, 200 meters, 500 meters, and we just calculated total amount of green space. We broke it up into two canopy, this would be like street trees, and then open green areas, which we, we simply called grassy areas. <coughs> so I'm, I'm going to go through the results just based on the three research questions. So the, the first one was what bees are found in Brooklyn Gardens? Uh, so through our two years of sampling, we collected over 1,600 bees, found 50 different species, including one that had never been found in Brooklyn before. 18% uh, of the 50 species were exotic. Is that a lot? Yes, it's a lot. That's basically nine species. There are, I think, around 20 to 22 non-native species of bees cataloged in North America. So we found nearly half of them in our New York City gardens. <coughs> um, this trend was documented by also by Kevin Madison, who did a similar bee study in the Bronx. But this is just such an interesting example of how human-modified landscapes affect community structure. Because there are a lot of bees out there. If you're not familiar, there are almost 20,000 species of bees globally, more than species of fish. And most of them are not social, like honeybees, which most people think of. But they're solitary, and most of them nest in the soil, for example. So if you go outside the city, the majority of species you find would tend to be the solitary soil nesters. You get an inverse community structure in the city in that most are cavity nesters just because there's not a lot of available soil. As I said, about 70% of New York is impervious surface. And then here are the different bees, a wide range from Bombus impatiens is your eastern bumblebee, Pipinapus prunosa is a squash bee, so you have a, a range of uh, generalists, some ag specialists, and a, a, just a wide range of diversity here. The second question, does bee diversity vary among gardens? This is something we were a little unsure of. And the resounding answer is that yes, it does, greatly so. Uh, if you look at the top part of this table, abundance, this is two years worth of data. So we had a garden that we collected for two years, bi-weekly, all summer long, we collected 18 bees. <laughs> Another one, we collected nearly 300, right? So drastic differences. Species richness, one, one garden, only seven different species of bees another 37. And so if you look at the garden characteristics, we felt pretty confident that we could build some type of model to explain this, because the gardens also varied widely, from very small to very large. Uh, plant diversity ranged from about 50 <coughs> to over 150 species. Some of these places I would call like hyper-diverse, they're just the gardeners planted many different plant species. Light availability, widely divergent, and then even landscape context has some variability as well. So. For question three, are there environmental predictors of bee diversity? We, we used a multiple regression approach with forward selection just to get the smallest number of variables that best explain the different bee diversity measures. And so we looked at abundance, species richness, and then we used a diversity index for the bees as our response. And so for bee abundance, that's just total number of bees regardless of species. Uh, you could accurately predict that using light availability and plant species richness. I include the coefficients here so you can sort of think about what that relationship would be. So for 
you know, for every additional plant species, you gain a B. If you have a coefficient of one. And then as the diversity measures get more complex, so do the models a bit. You see, if you want to know about B richness, the total number of different species, again, plant species richness and light availability are important, but you also get this factor in with the uh, landscape context as well, which makes sense if you think about it. If you have a food rich, very, a lot of light availability, you might get a lot of activity of bees, but you may not get a wide diversity, whereas bringing in the surrounding landscape context, if you have a lot of green space, you have many different nesting resources, alternative food resources, and you just might catch a larger number of bees. And then the diversity index, again, those same three, and also garden area seem to be a predictor for diversity, which includes both richness and evenness. So maybe more ecological niche space for the bees allows them to be a bit more even in that context. So what were some of the conclusions? Uh, the diversity and community structure of the community was definitely influenced by the urban setting in that we found lower species richness than you might elsewhere. For example, our research in tree fruit. Again, you have a, a pretty standardized cropping system. We found well over 100 species of bees there. So this urban setting really lowers the species richness and you get the fewer number of soil nesting species and a high number of exotics. The gardens vary greatly in bee diversity and land use patterns. So is there, maybe there's the opportunity there for gardens to augment more bees by changing some practices. And we found that bee diversity could be strongly predicted by local factors such as floral diversity and light availability. And to some extent, landscape context plays a role as those were included in the models for bee richness and diversity. And one result I didn't share, but again, we employed those similarity indices. There's a lot of data out there on bees in the city parks, like Central Park and Prospect Park from John Asher at the Museum of Natural History. So we did some similarity indices to compare what we were finding in community gardens to city parks, and we found substantial amounts of dissimilarity. And we think that's driven because the plant diversity is different. You get these ag species, and there are several bees that are specialists of certain ag species, such as the squash bee, Pipinapis pruinosa, the sunflower bee, Melisodes agilis. And so with these new resources, Without those community gardens there, those bees species would probably not be present in New York City at all. So uh, reason to support community gardens and put more of them in the city. <clears throat> and then I wanted to use the opportunity, since I did go through three different, completely different systems, just some overall closing thoughts from doing these community level work. So one is, despite the fact that I mentioned that there's lower species richness in these settings, it was still surprising the amount of diversity we did find. When we first started the work in the maze ecosystems on the transgenic maze, somebody commented that, why would you want to study diversity out there? It's, it's a barren landscape. You know, we found over 50 species of beetles. So we should view these managed landscapes as a place to conserve biodiversity. And there's increasing evidence that cities can even host a large amount of biodiversity. And then we also think community level work's important and that investment into taxonomy is important to establish baseline data as we have a rapidly and changing environments Again, due to climate change or urbanization is going to expand, agricultural production is going to expand with a growing human population. So there's so much out there we just don't even know about insect diversity. It's important to get these baseline data. The problem is we're in the middle of a taxonomic bottleneck where we have fewer and fewer taxonomists that can actually identify these little critters. Uh, the second broader point, uh, these ecotoxicological studies reveal that sometimes species respond differently than other species in the community to these treatment factors. And so we believe, especially I've had this conversation with Dave Bittinger, that there needs to be a role for these realistic systems-based community-level studies, field studies, in risk assessment. Uh, for example, in registering pesticides or things like that, the EPA might use honeybee as a surrogate for all pollinators. And we see that we get widely diff different responses to different things among different species. And so we know that you have to have a realistic approach because you can't test everything. However, we believe these community level studies, if you can invest the time and resources, could serve to augment those normal practices. And there's also increasing evidence coming out with bees of synergisms between pesticides and fungicides, even adjuvants like oils or adhesives that can affect toxicity. And you really don't pick that up unless Right, because you can't do every single combination in the lab. You pick that up, though, in the field. What's really going on, these different pest management systems? And then the last one is that the relative influence of the surrounding landscape in any given system uh, varies based on the ecological needs and dispersal of whatever 
taxonomic group you're working with or, or guild you're working with. Uh, for example, the bees were responding at a much larger scale than the predators and parasitoids in our tree fruit systems. So uh, in the tree fruit, again, we're working with funding from the Specialty Crop Research Initiative, USDA, on looking at those landscape factors. Also getting from NRCS some seed mixes of pollinator habitat to establish next to orchards and see if you can get things, food resources for before and after apple bloom per se to support pollinators in these landscapes. And acknowledgements. So again, I'm, I'm visiting from Long Island University. My appointment is primarily teaching there, so everything I presented here really wouldn't be possible without working with really wonderful collaborators. It allows me to stay active in the research realm. <coughs> and so at Long Island University, I've worked with uh, several great students who I've sort of converted into ecologists. Uh, Penn State University, Shelby Fleischer was my uh, mentor. David Biddinger, I work a lot with on this tree fruit collaborations and just his practical knowledge of those systems is, is, is really amazing. Uh, Chris Mullen, toxicologist at Penn State, and Neilandra Joshi was a postdoc. Uh, the reason I'm here is from working with Megan Gregory, who I met in the gardens in Brooklyn. She's also doing research there. I uh, obviously want to thank all the growers and community gardeners, and then the taxonomists. All this can't be done without them. I really relied heavily on John Asher and then Bob Davidson, and then this work was funded by se several different resources. So uh, I hope you found that interesting, as an entomologist in the horticulture department here. But uh, I can try to answer any questions if you have any. Also, if there are any students that are soon to graduate and considering different job opportunities, sometimes when I've given past seminars, they like to talk about that, working at a place like LIU or something like that. So, thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.